Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 651. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's March 12, 2021. All right, welcome 651. Dang, that's a lot of episodes, George. Uh, First of all, we want to thank the audience for sticking with us all this time. We're coming up on the 10th year anniversary in June, and there's one video that you can't find right now on the internet, and that's the first episode of Anglican Unscripted. It never made it to YouTube. We had a different format before we were, uh, Blip TV was our uh, host, and before that was something else. Uh, so when I finally transferred everything over to YouTube, I kind of left off like the first 10 episodes of Unscripted because nobody was really watching those. Well, I'm going to repost the first episode of Anglican Unscripted uh, on the 10th anniversary, which is sometime in June. And I could tell you when, but it's if you are subscribed, it will automatically pop up in your browser. You're going to click there and you go, oh my God, they were so young. What is this? <laughs> Nobody had gray hair. Kevin had hair. So uh, we. here's what I want you to do. Go to the comments section right now. Just push pause. Go there and tell us when you started watching Anglican Unscripted. What was the first episode you saw? And if you don't know the exact one, you could say in the teens or you've been watching since the first or the hundreds. Whatever you want to do, just let us know when you started watching because that's interesting to me. I think about 30% of the audience has watched from day one. And uh, that'd be kind of cool that we could uh, compile and find out who is here and not here. Do you remember, Kevin, at one episode early on, uh, I was giving away free cats. Uh, Our cat had kittens. And uh, (laughs) and, and just the other day, somebody wrote to me and said, do you still have any new cats to give away? Uh, uh, What was I think? If if you don't comment, we'll send you a cat. That's right. (laughs) We have our ways. So before you get too far into the show, please like this episode on Facebook and YouTube. Share it with your friends, family, and foes. Go to the comment section. Let us know how long you've been watching, but also comment on this episode. A lot of this Friday episode is kind of just follow up to some previous stories. We're still talking about Megan and Harry, you know. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the critical race theory and how it's been so debunked and it's still becoming a problem in the church. And then we got some news from Southeast Malaysia. So before we get to that, as the world knows, Oprah sat down wrote a check to Harry and Megan and said, would you do an interview with me? And they said, of course we would. How much? And they sat down and they did a wonderful interview talking about a range of subjects, mostly the monarchy, and uh, how oppressed they are as millionaire monarchy people. And it's made all the news. And it's really involved the Church of England now because Megan let out that, listen, we were married before the ceremony, Thanks to Archbishop Justin Welby uh, meeting us in the garden and we got to exchange vows and he uh, did this thing and closed his eyes and boom, we were married. Well, there were rumors that happened, but now we have confirmation from Megan it happened. We have denials and maybe a confirmation from Lambeth that happened. But the problem this, this leaves us is what are the rules in the Church of England if the monarchy doesn't have to follow them. I mean, we're, we're going back to a 1,600-year-old problem, George. So let, let's talk. Well, it's the same issue as the Church of Nigeria and Lambeth Palace last week. Yep. One rule for me, one rule for thee. Uh, you, you, the Nigerians must obey every jot and tittle of Lambeth 110, the American Church, the Church of England. Oh, they can do whatever they want to do mm-hmm. because it's pastoral. Justin Welby has uh, pulled the Church of England into the Harry and Meghan mess, and it's really uh, taken on a life of its own. We in the United States were treated on Mon- was it Sunday night? Sunday night. Long time. It uh, seems like a year ago now. <laughs> Sunday night for the broadcast. They, it was replayed in the UK the next day, and it's caused a great deal of controversy. Um, now, I don't think it achieved, if the aim was to make the the Windsor, the Sussexes more Sussex. lovable, likable, it failed in that. 
and that the polling in the UK shows that Meghan's popularity has plummeted such that she is only Prince Andrew has a worse reputation than she does. Which is difficult for a princess in Britain to do. Princess Di was one of the most loved figures in the history of Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember the wedding. I mean, that, that was everything. I mean, uh, all the 20-something girls I hung out with or worked with at the time were watching that, were emulating that, wanted to, when they got married, wear the dress that Diane wore, um, make sure they did have a, a, a boyfriend with the big ears that Charles had. But, you know, there, there was just something that the, the emphasis of that marriage at that time really made uh, the biggest PR uh, boon for the monarchy in England that I can think of. So being a princess is a big deal in Britain because people want to emulate that around the world. And it's a big deal within a certain section of the United States population. Uh, people like my sister-in-law, uh, she was a teenager at the time of the Charles and Diana wedding, and she followed that every moment moment by moment uh, my wife susan loved watching that and reading the magazines you mm -hmm. know it's it's a harmless fun uh passion uh for some people but megan uh, has not achieved the gift that diana had achieved of winning popular applause in fact she's managed to make piers morgan a hero in American conservative circles. Now, that's really a hard thing to do. Piers Morgan, many of you know, is a for, has been on CNN. He had a show for a while. He he's an international media celebrity. He was on Good Morning, uh, the Ameri the English version of Good Morning America, or the Today Show, uh, Good Morning Britain, and he was harshly critical of Meghan, saying that he believes that she was fabricating many of her accusations and he pointed out that uh, he didn't believe the mental illness story and part of that was that uh, harry her husband is a patron of several mental health illness charities of mental illness awareness and his diana had problems with depression harry's had problems with depression and to think that harry is either so uh, silly or remote as not to want to help his own wife on the issue that he's been promoting in the public eye beggars belief and Piers Morgan got kicked, you know fired uh, essentially he got fired uh, for making these because uh, as Don Lemon on CNN now says if you don't believe uh, Meghan Markle you're a racist and so this has now entered the American culture wars, the British culture wars. But I have to say, Megan seems to be losing. Certainly, if you look on Twitter, the, the memes that are coming across are, are anti megan 101. She's losing the meme war. She's losing the princess war. And now, if you ever go back and reread um, when she was first going to be the princess, they wanted to find her strange father who was in some... Uh, South American country somewhere. Mexico. Or or Mexico, yeah. yeah. And they found him, and, you know, he said, you want to know about Megan? <laughs> he wrote several letters uh, to places like the Daily Mail explaining Megan. Why don't you go back now and reread those after this interview? Watch the interview first, and you're like, okay. Okay, maybe we were being a little astray about um, her, her gift of persuasion at the attacks on the royal family uh, really well smack of ingratitude and being and revengeful and venality uh, it's just unnecessary you can have difficulties with your in-laws uh, but if they're public persona uh, you really have to be careful what you say um, the, but the result has been that Prince Charles uh, comes out looking good and when Prince Charles comes Prince Charles, who has had probably the worst 25 years of any public person I know uh, in his uh, press engagements, when he's starting to look good and uh, sympathetic, Reasonable. <laughs> I saw one meme uh, 
a, a meme is a photo that is doctored to and with a little funny catch line. Uh, it may or may not have words, but it's basically to make a point uh, like a cartoon. And there's what the, the thing that just I had me in my, in the uh, my wife and I just rolling with laughter. And there's the photo of when Charles meets uh, his new grandchild, Archie, and Megan is holding him on his lap. And Prince Charles has into his hand photoshopped one of these little paint paint uh, spectrum things that you get at Home Depot, and it looks like he's holding up the paint spectrum to the child's uh, skin tones, which of course is a reference to uh, an unnamed senior royal who's not the Queen or Prince Philip, who's left, uh, wanted to know what color the baby would be. Now that accusation of racism seems pretty horrendous but if if it's okay it, it, but if people are comfortable his point I wasn't ashamed at laughing at the Prince Charles thing mm -hmm. because Megan's so unbelievable it's almost joking but into all this crap excuse me Justin Welby has pushed the Church of England once again now, because I don't really follow the royals, and I should because I'm part of the Church of England, part of the Anglican Communion, and I, and I hate to admit this because I'm an observationalist. I observe things. I did not know of Meghan Markle's Caucasian-lessness until three or four weeks after the wedding. I was reading a story about her being uh, uh, of African descent, and I go, I was surprised. Now, that's because I'm ignorant. Ask my wife. <laughs> she will confirm I am ignorant on so many things. I thought for sure two Caucasian people were getting married in Britain that day. And I, because I'm an ignorant racist, I didn't know, George. So uh, I, I'm old. Maybe I need to get the prescription updated. Who knows? So uh, live and learn. Uh, so enough, Megan, enough, Harry. I'm sure that story will live on forever. Um, well, let, 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 let's uh, tie in Justin Welby's. Uh, uh, we've been, I've been receiving correspondence of clergy in the Church of England who were put out by Justin Welby's response to did he indeed perform a marriage before the marriage at, at St. George's Chapel, Windsor. Mm -hmm. And the Archbishop of Canterbury's office put out a very dismissive, well, we don't talk about these pastoral things. Uh, the net effect is that uh, we're not going to tell you whether... Now, he shouldn't talk about pastoral things, but did he, did he violate the rules of the Church of England for the royal family? Uh, he, that's an easy yes or no. Mm -hmm. um, but so instead, so now you have uh, some local, small... Uh, parish clergy basically having to explain to people no we can't have a wedding of just you know we can't do what megan and Harry. you can't have a beach wedding yeah absolutely so and you know that's the reality here is here justin if the press asks you a question you don't have the answer send a quick email to george and i and we will compose an answer for you justin Archbishop of Canterbury, did you perform a wedding before the wedding for Harry and Meghan? I don't know how to answer this. Kevin and George, how to answer this? Yes, we had a second rehearsal. Meghan performed even better at the second rehearsal. She probably thought it was a wedding. Guess you did so well. End of topic. The press would love yeah. that. Meghan yeah. would love that. <laughs> And here's an opportunity to teach about the power and the sanctity of marriage. Yeah. So instead of oper inst these these uh, issues, crises, if you will, always can be presented as opportunities for teaching and empowering and sharing the love and joy and powers of God, the purpose of marriage, what a wonderful thing. Or you can step on it by coming off as being rather detached and arrogant. Uh, and this is what's happened once again. Yeah, so, all right, let's enough Harry, enough Megan, enough Royals. We'll, we'll put in the UK aside for a while. Let's talk our favorite topic: critical race theory. Now, before I get you know too far into this, critical race theory is easily the most debunkable theory 
uh, in the last 50 years when it comes to um, the study of sociology. It doesn't take too much to go to an Asian country and say, well, they don't have superior white people here. Or go to African nations and say, well, there's no superior white people here. And go to you know, Latin America, there's no superior white people here. You know, it's not too hard to debunk it just by using reason, common sense, and uh, put the, the, the white guilt in your back pocket for a couple minutes. Yet, I think it is still working its way through the church, and we have a, uh, uh, a famous uh, evangelical who said, yes, it's, it's starting to really take hold in e e evangelical circles too. And I'm like, you know, guys, stop it. There's a famous Bob Newhart episode where uh, a lady sits down and he goes, I have a new policy. I only charge $5 uh, for each appointment. Are you sure? Because I have some really big problems. He says, no, I'm pretty sure. And every time she started to complain about it, stop it. No, my dog yaps. Stop. My boyfriend, no, stop. <laughs> At this point, with critical race theory, stop it i'll put a link to the the episode in the show notes critical race through is completely debunked please church stop it youssef agrees with me george michael youssef who's a uh, rector of the church of the apostles in atlanta michael youssef is an anglican but he has an independent church he's licensed by the diocese of sydney and once upon a time was an Episcopal priest. He did an interview with the Christian Post where he talked about critical race theory and wokeness as being a cancer that's, that's my word, a cancer that's, cu that's cutting through the evangelical world. It's already overcome the mainline denominations, but the, the, the battles that the mainline churches fought and lost over these, these uh, heretical views is now being waged in the evangelical world and as uh, Yusuf says more and more pastors are falling into the trap uh, of woke culture because it's popular and appeals to the flesh and Yusuf says you know this will be the death of evangelical culture when it seeks to uh, appease the world go along with the world what different and, and instead of putting Christ front and center uh, this is the death of the church as an as a vehicle for bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to people because all it does is recycle the culture well, Very but, powerful interview with Michael Youssef. Yeah, the biggest problem with there's four main problems with uh, critical race theory the, the one of the biggest ones is the redefinition of words mm -hmm. You know, we're redefining things and we redefine them to make no sense at all and we put large peoples in those categories of that redefinition. And in doing so, we have created a false narrative. Critical race theory is not how we were created. Critical race theory has nothing to do with who we are as individuals or a society. What it's trying to do is blame a group of individuals for the color of their skin for all the ills in the world and that i hate to say this is racism with a capital capital exclamation point with an exclamation point you you, you can't be any more racist than to group again uh, a a people together by the color of the skin and blame them for something or give them an attribute that is racism so to see this being taken into the church and adopted because we have this built-in guilt, we do as Christians anyway, we, uh, we know we're guilty of something, we, we confess it, we repent of it, and we turn and, and walk forward. There's no way you can repent of critical race theory. There's no way you can repent into wokeness because liberals do not believe in repentance. Liberalism in, in any shape and form does not believe in the ability of a white person to stop what they're doing and, and, and turn away from it, or any color person for that matter. So critical race theory is a failure on the level of forgiveness. They don't forgive. They don't recognize repentance. So stop bothering to do it.
please. <sighs> I've, I've gone on. So, but here's the problem, George. We're starting, not start. we've seen it now in the ACNA. We've seen clearly the Episcopal Church and others have fully adopted it. And now we have right upon us the Equality Act. Uh, it, it's making its way. And, you know, one day or another, I see it's more popular or less popular, and it may get passed by the Senate. That's scary because the, the Equality Act is woke 101. But God's in charge, uh, Kevin. And the truth that the, the world, that the U.S. government, uh, even bishops in the ACNA are trying to teach us that critical race theory is the future. Uh, Todd Hunter, in his uh, recent letter to the Diocese of C4SO, uh, I'll give you a quote. Uh, well, I won't give you a quote because I can't see it in front of me, but critical race theory is the way to build churches and build America. Stop it. There, I hope that worked. <laughs> and it, it's just not so. Um, the oh, we, have a, we have a something that's happening in M Malaysia. Uh, the Muslim fundamentalist government a number of years ago passed laws saying that Christians cannot use the word Allah to ref in Christian literature, because Allah can only refer to the Muslim God. Well, Christians would respond to this, but you know, God, uh, that's the word we use in our language. We're not referring to uh, Muhammad's Allah, we're referring to God as we would say God. And just as in, you know, we have Hindu gods, and Buddhist, you know, this and that and the other. And this was a result over the years of uh, of prayer books being printed in the melee, uh, being seized by customs at the docks because they violate Muslim law by referring to God. And the, the Malaysian state redefined what Allah meant. Well, uh, there's recently been a court victory for the Christians uh, where the common sense rule that uh, the government can't redefine words that have a thousand year history of meaning something else just to suit a political passing fad. Now, this is the exact issue, different uh, words, but it's the exact issue that we're facing here in critical race theory. And it's affecting so many levels. I was watching Gunga Din on Turner Classic Movies the other day. Good and movie. movie from the 1930s and uh, Harry Grant, Victor McLaughlin, uh, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., mm -hmm. and Sam Jaffe plays Gunga Din, the uh, hero of the Kipling story, uh, a water bearer who becomes a hero at the end of the day. You're a better man than I am, Gunga Din, from poem. Well, Turner Classic Movies had to have a whole disclaimer at the beginning that uh, it really was wrong for Sam Jaffe, a Jewish actor, to play an Indian in the 1930s who's the hero of the film and that it in other words we're getting lectured before movies uh john wayne in the searchers where his niece is kidnapped by indians and he's a homicidal in man who hates all indians we're told this is bad john wayne is a bad person in this movie and we don't want you to be like john wayne in this movie Good, because he was a racist in the movie. <laughs> movie, and, yeah, and John Ford, when he made the movie, had John Wayne play a villain. And but we're too stupid, according to the programmers, the Turner Classic Movies, to figure out that we don't just emulate John Wayne and now decide to hate Indians because they kidnapped our niece. And the common sense is dying in this country every day. I. I mean, I've seen Gunga Din on Turner Classic Movies in the past, but I've never had this woke introduction to help me help me overcome my implicit biases. I, I, I mean, a lot I've has always... no, uh, <laughs> a lot has changed. Here. I mean, right now, a straight person cannot play a gay character in television mm -hmm. or in movies. Even though some of the greatest gay characters were played by Robin Williams, um, he did a marvelous job uh, in in past comedies. 
Uh, you're just not allowed to do that. And so we're losing our ability to act, to perform outside of our, 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 our comfort zone. We also have complaints now because it wasn't Wonder Woman uh, cast, but she was from Israel or something. I, I forget Wonder the Wonder Woman is Jewish. Jewish, and, that's right, yeah. And <laughs> my goodness, you would think the Nazis, uh, Der Stürmer and Joseph Goebbels were movie yeah. reviewers these days, that we can't watch Wonder Woman because she's yeah. Israeli. No. And I think one of the things that really divides us is we have classified words and classified people and classified definitions. And this is going to be controversial. This is going to be, this is this is this is raw, unscripted. There's a certain word I can't say. I would never say it, but because of the color of my skin, the word starts with N. I'm not allowed to say it. People of a different skin tone use it very frequently in rap music and uh, in their social dialogue and talking to each other. If I were to say it, I would be canceled. I hear me. I wouldn't say it, but I'm not allowed to say it. There's no free speech there, you know. And so, hear me. I wouldn't say it. Don't cancel me. But in a free society, I should be able to think I could say it. Yeah. Once, so. once upon the time, the ACLU defended the right of the American Nazi Party to march through Skokie, Illinois. Remember that? <laughs> and they won. Remember that. <laughs> and the ACLU uh, is a, a very liberal, uh, progressive. S- progressive. Mm-hmm. At the time, uh, oh, uh, the, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was its chief counsel. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Blues Brothers not, made fun of this in their movie. The, the Blues yeah. Brothers was had this in the movie. It was hilarious. And the, the, the ACLU are not Nazis, but they defended the right of the Nazis to be stupid and obnoxious. Absolutely. Those days of free speech are long gone. Long gone. Because so the, when ACLU they were, no, the ACLU now is on the side of Facebook and YouTube in censoring. Uh, let me... Get, um, I do morning well, and well, evening prayer. Well, can I? Can, you go ahead. Yeah. I do morning and evening prayer from my chapel, and I put it on Facebook and YouTube for mostly the congregation. But we have a number of people from around the world who like to watch and pray with me. And I decided to spend ten bucks and do some Facebook advertising. Good choice. Why not? You know, yeah. Facebook keeps asking me, Come "Would on. you like to promote this post?" And I was flush, so I had ten dollars to spend, and I spent ten dollars. And it came back, uh, Facebook, you cannot advertise this because the content violates our uh, our social our policies. Deuteronomy? Well, you were reading from Deuteronomy then? No, uh, no. There's it, there's no. I don't preach at morning prayer. I read the Venite, the Jubilate, the Psalms. I, you know, it's entirely laid out. It's in the Book of Common Prayer, the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer, for goodness sakes. And then I read passages from Scripture set by the lectionary. And whatever passage of Scripture I must have read that day triggered Facebook to refuse to advertise. Morning prayer cannot be advertised. Now, I, I didn't bother appealing it uh maybe i should have uh might have been done by a machine algorithm that uh, they heard me reading something from the book of romans and therefore i must be some wicked racist person you know means christ there is no slave nor free G- uh, greek nor jew male nor female all are one in christ well of course uh, i must be promoting slavery or anti-semitism or uh, misogyny according to the computer algorithms it's silliness Back to Illinois and the Nazis. The Nazis won the case. The ACLU was like, yeah, freedom. The Nazis spoke. Nobody listened. They finally got to hold the parade. Nobody showed up. They went down in history because they had the freedom of speech and nobody wanted to hear them. They made the news because we tried to block their freedom of speech. Yeah, the Nazis contended in the free market of ideas, mm-hmm. and their product nobody bought. Nobody bought. And so now, so now, American Nazis are, 
I don't want to say they're not existent. I'm sure there's some nut in the woods in Idaho somewhere. So, George, they now wear woke. They're out there. The 300 odd million people in the United States, you're going to find your fair share of kooks and cranks. And not all of them watch this show. Uh, <laughs> no, <they don't. laughs> we're going to expand our demographic, George. All but, right. but but the culture in which we live in today is we're seeing a pincer movement. Uh, Mike, this is what Michael Youssef is warning about. Yeah. Um, the evangelical world is we have bishops in the ACNA who have swallowed this hook, line, and sinker. And if you want to see the fruits of this, go on to the Anglican Minority and Ethnic Network Facebook group page. And what yeah. is the tone? Yeah. It's pretty darn nasty. Is this a place of love and peace, compassion, and where God's joy is made manifest in, in the, the risen Jesus Christ? No. It's hectoring, abusive language, uh, denunciations. This is the fruit of woke Christianity that Bishop Hunter is promulgating. Well, hold on now. I heard a rumor. No, we don't do a lot of rumors on the show because rumors are, you know, rumors are rumors. Um, but it may be if you let out the rumor, you'll finally get the news. I heard a rumor that there was a negotiation going on for a comparable compromise uh, with Bishop Hunter to go our separate ways. The ACNA and uh, Bishop Hunter would, would part ways. I don't know if the rumor is true. I heard it from a, a, a reputable enough source that hmm, maybe, maybe. Well, I asked Andrew Gross, the ACNA press officer, and he says there's no truth in that that he's aware of. I trust Andrew implicitly, so maybe there's nothing to that rumor, um, or it hasn't reached the head office, so who knows. But we'll have to see. George, what a great show for 651. Got all the topics covered here in the list. Once again, reminding you, if you have not, if you made it through the whole show, if you've not liked it yet on Facebook, now is a great opportunity to show how much you liked it. Because we're coming up on our 10th anniversary Go to the comments section. Let us know when you started watching Anglican Unscripted. I know I can say episode one is the first one I watched. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 651 of Anglican Unscripted.